Thank you for making it out. And how was traffic? I wasn't too bad, man. Thanks for having me. Yeah, you were uh, downtown LA? Yep. Okay, so straight 20 minutes, 30 minutes? Yeah, it was 20, 24 minutes, I think uh, MapQuest said. It, isn't it amazing how, like, um, the, most places, like I lived in Santa Cruz, Monterey, if something's five miles away and you say, how far, it, how far is it? People say five miles away. Here it's like 20, 30 minutes. Well, how far did you drive? Six miles. Six miles, yeah. You know, and that 20, 30 minutes sometimes is an hour. Yeah, it's always uh, more minutes than uh, miles. 100%. Yep. 100%. So we met last week. Uh, your nickname is Bob Moonshine, yep. right? Uh, why is that? Um, I just been a, I've been a whiskey connoisseur for quite a while now. And uh, basically how I got started was, you know, I used to go out, I uh, knew some guys that did some tastings and stuff like that. So I really got to taste a lot of different, uh, you know, scotches, bourbons, everything like that, and just become a hobby for me. You know, I really enjoyed it, you know, enjoyed drinking it old fashions and stuff. So <clears throat> I basically uh, went to a place one time and they had a barrel aged old fashioned. So I started barrel aging my own old fashions, you know, basically yeah. take the ingredients, let it set at least six, eight weeks. Amazing. So you would buy your barrels and... Yep. And wood yep. barrels, obviously, is the way to go. Yeah. Uh, charcoal, yeah, burned inside. So it's that, it's kind of, I mean, I don't want to say it's that simple, but it, it's the, the beginning step starts off that simple. Yeah, it's kind of crazy where it blew up to, but that's how simple it was. And what got me to want to start making my own moonshine was, was somebody asked me one day, well, did you make this? You know, well, you, in like my not, mind, I bought bullet bourbon and, you know, and, and I write, uh, you know, I mixed all the ingredients together and aged in the barrel, but I didn't make the whiskey. Yeah. So it was just like a light bulb. It kind of clicked, and I said, you know what? I'm going to buy a still. So I went and bought an eight-gallon still to start off with. and uh, said, I'm going to make my own rye. I'm going to age it for however long it takes, because in the smaller barrels, it's not like you got to age it for three years like in a big barrel. Right. <clears throat> it's less. So um, I started off with that, and uh, I, I mean, realistically, with an eight-gallon still, you only get about a gallon, gallon and a half of booze. You know, and as it, what's a still run? Um, I mean, the whole setup for that one, because you have to have your mash pots and all that stuff, too, and your grains and everything to make it. We could talk the whole process. But uh, it was about 1500 bucks to start out. Fifteen to 2000 you could have everything to use to cook. And, I mean, that's everything from your mash pot, you know, to um, basically your still, a couple jugs, you know, even your, your hydrometer. The all, whole kit. The whole kit. <clears throat> To, to, pro, to make a gallon every two months or something? Well, I mean, it only takes about, once you're mashing, you, you know, you mash it during the day, and then normally it takes seven to ten days to ferment, and you can cook it. So, less than a week, you know, I would say a week, you could cook that gallon and a half. Yeah. Well, I ended up uh, selling, because my buddy got in, really started getting involved in it, so I ended up, I mean, I it was a lot of work just for a gallon and a half. You right. Know? And when you make moonshine, <clears throat> it's not consistent. So, like... It might be coming out at 150 proof and about, not for that one, but like on my bigger still I'll get to, it drops like 10% every so often. Right. So like I, I ended up going to a 26 gallon still and I get five solid gallons of booze out of that. It's Holy just straight shit. white lightning. So like my first, my first gallon, depending on what I'm making, my first gallon can come out anywhere between 150, 160 proof and it drops about 10 proof every gallon which is perfect because I don't like to take it past a hundred proof because you start getting what they got. They call the heads, the hearts and the tails. So, you know, your heads are higher proof. Your hearts are obviously, you know, your, your best group in between there, I'd say like 130 to a hundred, you know? Yeah. And then your tails, uh, <clears throat> it's still a hundred proof, 180 proof. I'll still cook it, but it'll get cloudy. It gets like imperfections in it. Right. But I'll use those again when I cook again and it boosts the proof. So it's like it's almost distilling that that gallon or two. Yeah, you like recycle it until you get what you it's want. It's just like, you know, vodka's distilled like three or four times. Yeah. I mean, vodka doesn't have much flavor because they keep cooking it out. So that's why, like with bourbon, you know, a lot of the times you'll cook it twice. You know, like, believe it or not, George Watch, uh, Washington was a bootlegger, and his biggest uh, sell was his stuff that he, he batched twice. He distilled twice. Yeah. You know, because it takes more time, and it will take a little of the flavor. It's a little bit of an art, but... For that, it'll boost your proof. Yeah. Uh, and, and then um, that's such a good fucking skill, you know, because if there's a zombie apocalypse, like that's something where like, oh, I'll trade you ammo, if you, you know, for my alcohol, you know, like that's you have something that you can make without relying on much other things than yourself. 
Yeah, as long as you can get the grains and stuff like that. Yeah. I mean, and you it, trade, you know. I'll give you once once this batch is ready, I'll pay you back for the grain. You know? Yeah, yeah, you, you start trading and stuff like that. But yeah, it's like it's, we know what you would do in The Walking Dead. Like you know, you'd be that yeah. guy. You know, just yeah. machine gun and guy with an M sixteen making yeah, yeah moonshine. The higher the proof, the better. And I mean, you know, I I have really high just white lightning stuff. You know, I make a uh, an apple pie moonshine. An uh, apple pie moonshine. Wow, that, <laughs> I well, got to try that. So it's funny, it, it, that's where it started was the old fashions for me to make my own rye. And then it blew up to an apple pie moonshine, um, a fireball. Uh, I make a bourbon, I make a rye, I make a French oak, and then I make a, just the, the regular white lightning. And it all just blew up just from that. So basically how that started was when you make the apple pie, you normally got about to have 150, 140, 140 proof um, white lightning. Because when you fill it up with the other, the apple juice and the cider and all the other stuff you mix it with, it cuts it in half. So it's about 70 proof. So I had those for the higher proofs, but then the 100 proof stuff, it was like either I aged in a barrel and I'd have extra. So I just one day I'm like, what do I do? I, I bet you I can make my own. I don't really drink Fireball, but I said, you know what? Let's try it. So, you know, basically it's just the white lining with some sugar and cinnamon sticks in it and it sits in a jar and it. <laughs> It's a hundred proof, and like you know, fireballs only sixty five, and my stuff is way better. Yeah, you know, everybody. Oh, your fireballs. <laughs> now, now, question about the fireball because I tried your fireball. Your fireball is a million times better. I can't stand the actual fireball. It's it's yeah. too sweet. Yours is more of an alcohol. It's it, it, it's it's more gourmet. Yeah. Um, is that? I, I for a moment I thought fireball was the name of that brand. Is it a brand or is Fireball's it? Fireball is a brand. Okay, it's, and that's why it just tastes yeah. like a fireball. Yeah. No, because I started thinking. Jack maybe, Daniels has a blend too. Yeah, they can call it Fire Jack or something like that. They call it. So yeah, yeah. Everybody says, "What are you going to name it?" And I think you guys were laughing. They were calling it Cinnamon Toast or something. Yeah, so like yeah. That. So everybody was like, "This is Cinnamon Toast." Yeah. Yeah. yeah so yeah, you kind of you kind of <clears throat> made me break my rule. I have a I have a two wheel two drink rule. You know, gotcha. not that night. <laughs> not that night. Yeah. <laughs> not we, that night. But I ate like three burgers after the whole thing. So. Yeah, that was pretty, I like doing tastings like that. I enjoy it. You know, I got the spouts for the jars and stuff, and I tell everybody a little bit about it. This is this, this is aged, and, and then you taste I enjoy that too, you know. So yeah, of course. It's a great experience. So what's the goal with this? Are, you, you just want to do it for yourself? You want to, you know, promote it? You want to get, you want to, like, get a contract and start doing this at a big, you know, commercial I, level? What, what would I've be the goal? A, I've had a couple people come to me and say, oh, you know, let me be a private investor, you know, in stuff like that. And I'm like, oh, you know, I'm about, I'm a little about two and a half years away from retirement to where I could really have time to do something like that. Yeah. So I, I am looking into it. I looked at licensing, you know, it's believe it or not, it's only like $600 for their permit and 300 bucks a year for the license. As long wow. as you don't make over a hundred thousand gallons, which is a lot of booze. Yeah. You know, so I mean, realistically I could legally do it. I just, I yeah, don't know. You can legally <clears throat> do it and, and provide for your family and live comfortably at that that scale it, it's all about you know like you said with the 600 dollars license wow that's nothing yeah with selling you know how much can you make obviously you have to get bigger stills you have to get bigger quantities of stuff yeah you, you have to ramp it up and obviously you got to have somebody selling it getting it out to bars getting it out to you know restaurants grocery stores you know all that kind of stuff like that unless I mean, if you that's, open up your own bar and you just serve your own yeah, yeah. I, I had uh, I had an opportunity to buy a bar, and I live in Monrovia, and there was a place up on Myrtle, and the guy was converted to a whiskey bar. But you know, that's the other thing is you open up a bar, or a restaurant, you're, it's you know, it's uh, life changing because you're you're dedicated to it. You yeah. know, your you know, days or nights. Well, you know, there's no a, weekends. There's you know, no weekends. vacations, holidays. You know, that's how you make your money. That's where the most is, and you got to be there to watch it. Because and there's dramas and fights and all that other shit. That's one of the biggest turnover for employees. You yeah. know, as a, as a restaurant, and then, you know, where do you lose your money? You ever watch Bar Rescue? It's your pores. You know, it's just, I just didn't know if I wanted to get into something like that. But, I mean, I enjoy doing this. <clears throat> um, I'm going to drink it regardless, you know. Yeah. And I enjoy uh, people coming to my house. I mean, <laughs> I got more booze than That's anybody so on the planet. Cool. <laughs> you know, you know it, it's it's very awesome. I, I've had, I have, right now, I have a few friends that I've been going to their houses, and they've been doing these experiences. I'm like, this is so fucking cool. Like one of my buddies, he uh, I went to his house, and he has a huge tequila, you know, uh, collection. So he brought all the tequila bottles out, like 30, 40 bottles, and he it was just little pours. So it was like, try this one. This one came from this, and he's 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 a nerd about the tequila and this grower and that grower. And and if you mention anything commercial, he laughs, you know. So he, he goes very private. And then this past weekend, 
I went to my buddy's house, George, and and what his thing was, uh, I thought it was cool. He bought the the hot sauces, you know, the ten hot sauces. They do that celebrity hot sauce thing where you try each one. Yeah. And he did a bunch of wings, and he got a Ziploc bag, and there was five of us, and he put five wings with the hot sauce, mixed it in. Each person got their own, and we were going up levels, and it was funny because people couldn't last, and then one was burning his tongue, and you know these these experiences are awesome. So the fact that you make your own moonshine and share this experience at your home, that, I mean, that by itself is fucking... I got a pool in the backyard, so summertime, it's always like people come over from my house, it's like, you know... Do you I kick them shoot. out if they don't drink or something? No, no, but I mean, <laughs> it, it, they drink, you know. Mm -hmm. I, I'm uh, the host of the most because, you know, I just have so much booze, and I'll be like, taste this, taste this, and they're like, slow down, I got to make it the rest of the day. Like, for me, though, I'm used to it, you know. Most yeah. of my bourbons I'm drinking are 100 to 130 proof, so like a sip... But uh, a funny story real quick, uh, a younger kid came over from uh, somebody we knew and, you know, me, I just hand out whole bottles of apple pie here. You're here for the day. You know, here's your jar. Yeah. And I, well, I looked over, uh, he had just got there about 40 minutes later, three quarters of his jar was gone. Oh my God. And I was like, okay, you know, so he made it through the day, but I guess the, that night he, uh, I'm sorry, the next morning he calls and says, uh, I can't find my glasses. Did I leave my glasses over there? And we're like. I looked everywhere. I couldn't find his glasses. He ended up finding them in the blueberries in his fridge. Oh, my that God. That morning. So he, go, he was. <laughs> well, you know, I, I, I woke up the next day. I mean, I didn't drink a whole lot either, right? You know, I sampled pretty much all, all the flavors. But um, but I drank mine. Most people were kind of like sipping, and then they would pour it into the, the glass. I felt great the next day. So I've also had people come, too, because my stuff is very, uh, how could I say it? I, I, use, I use a stainless steel still, not a copper, because I think it's cleaner. It's better. Uh, my, my quality of my booze is very good. So I've had people say, I drink your stuff, and, and uh, man, I'm not hung over the next day. And I'm mean, Don't get me wrong. You drink enough of anything, you'll get a hangover. Yeah. But even with me, even my regular bourbons, I drink, you know, high-quality bourbons, you know, even though they're a high proof. And I don't have the, the hangovers like I would, I think, like just with an 80-proof jack or something. Yeah. It's just a better age quality booze, better, better. Uh, um. Well, it, it, it's, it's, it's better quality. Number one, that's why it tastes better, but then they're not filling it up with sugar and, and sugar's like the number one thing that I notice. Like I, I can't obviously my early twenties, you know, an AMF or a long Island, that's like all I wanted to drink, yeah. but now I, I can't touch that. I, I'll drink a bottle. No problem. I'll drink all day, but it has to be pure alcohol, maybe rocks. You know, I don't even like putting soda in my drinks anymore. No, I had a friend of mine. He gave me a great analogy. I was, uh, I was putting, you know, Coke with a, with a cognac. And he's like, don't do that. And I go, I go, what's the difference, man? You drink the cognac and then you drink a Coke after. He's all, Robert, you wouldn't dip a hamburger in a soda, would you? And I go, no. And he goes, you bite it and enjoy it. And then you drink your soda. I was like, oh, okay, that makes sense. Yeah, it, it, it is definitely that way. Like you, you know, it's like your wine snobs, you know, don't drink it cold or you can't put ice in it. And yeah. to me, I mean, or añejos, like tequila añejos, <clears throat> don't mix it with anything. Yeah, I mean, your bourbon guys are that way too. Some of them, like, if you put it on the rocks, they're like a little mm -hmm. snooty. You know what I mean? You should be mm -hmm. drinking that neat. So, I mean, I'll try it neat, but, but just like anybody else, I, I drink my drink how I want to drink it. And I never tell anybody you know, how they should drink it. You want ice in it? You want to do whatever? I mean, like you said, with Coke, I'd be like, oh, I'm not giving you the good stuff. I got some other stuff yeah. I'll give you. But we're not doing it with that, but, I, you know. Yeah, it's, it's like um, like Patron. Patron. Patron's terrible. It's fucking nasty, and this is why you chill it. This is why you add salt. This is why you have a lime, yeah. and this is why you do a countdown with your friends and like, all right, we're going to do this shit in three, two, one, and you ah, and you bite, and, and, and you still make all those faces even though it's you know what I iced and chilled and blah, 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 because it, it's just terrible. But when you get into you know, higher and better alcohols, like I love Glass Azul uh, tequila. You can't mix that with anything. If you mix it with anything, you're just messing it up, you know? Yeah. So you, you got to stick to it. But I, but I noticed it's the sugar. I noticed that the cheaper shit, they cover it with sugar so you can't taste how strong and disgusting it is. Yeah, and I mean, your bourbons, I mean, the only time that, I mean, obviously you're getting the alcohol from the sugar, but any booze is right. that way, you know, because you're adding sugar to the mash. But once it cook, it's not like you're adding any sugar to it. I mean, yeah. it's just pure booze. And a lot of people have a misconception. Like uh, I, I hear a lot of people say, well, I don't drink dark booze. I do realize it's all white. The only thing that changes the color is the barrel. It's yeah. just getting the colors and the, and the flavor from the barrels. The only thing that changes it. You know? I was in uh, I was in <coughs> Vegas uh, at Zuma and Zuma has a uh, it's like a Japanese American fusion kind of place. And they have this uh, one drink called Burning History. 
and it's a Japanese whiskey. But what the reason I'm bringing it up is because they 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 bring a piece of uh, the barrel of Macallan. Uh, I want to I believe it's Macallan 18, and they grab the barrel and they burn it with a torch. And after it burns, they blow it off and they grab the smoke and they fill the cup with just the smoke of it, and then they mix their drink in there. Fucking amazing! Wow. But the smells and you know it it, it it enhances the taste of the whole. Yeah, because ninety nine percent of all Japanese whiskey is Scotch. They just right. can't call it Scotch. Yeah, I mean, we were talking about that. Why can't they? Why can't? Isn't bourbon a cognac? Why can't a Scotch be called a Scotch? Why can't a, a sparkling wine be a champagne? <coughs> same thing. It's about, you know, champagne is from France. A lot of people don't know that. Yeah, the only way you can call it same with Scotch it has to be made in Scotland. Irish whiskey, you know, from Ireland. Bourbon is from America. So when it just says whiskey. Uh, it could be identical to a bourbon or even a, a scotch or whatever, but they can only call it uh, um, whiskey. Basically, your your general content of a, of, a, of a straight bourbon needs to be 61% corn or more <clears throat> and a charred oak barrel aged for at least three years. That's your pretty generic uh, thing on that. And believe it or not, all your scotches, most of your scotches are aged in X bourbon barrels. So, like, yeah, Jack yeah, Daniels yeah. is the biggest export of barrels to Scotland for that. Now, uh, Irish whiskey has a little bit different rule. That there's no specific, like, barrels, uh, barrel or age to that. So, they can use any type of barrel. Or, like, you know, it's a charred oak white uh, um, oak barrel for, you know, bourbon and so forth and stuff like that. I mean, I'm sure there's a couple of other rules, but that's just your basics. So, that's what they call it. So, like, for example, your rye has got to be 61% rye or more. It's not a bourbon. It's a rye. Technically, I mean, you know, sometimes you'll see it called a rye bourbon or something like that. I mean, it's pretty close. Uh, but like your Jack Daniels, that's why they call it Tennessee whiskey. They just they uh, charcoal filter it. So as soon as you do that, you can't call it a bourbon anymore. Mm. Just like Gentleman's Jack's been distilled like two or three times. Not distilled, I mean charcoal filtered. Right. And it smooths it out a little bit, just like your vodkas. It smooths it out and stuff like that. So as soon as you do that, supposedly you can't call it a, uh, a bourbon. Yeah. And then you got like your cast strengths. You know, that all come out, it comes out whatever the proof is in the barrel, whatever you age it. And most of your stuff comes out high like that, and then they'll water it down to a uh, specific, like, so it's 90 across the board. So so it's not just the region where it comes from, it's it's the way they, they there is a difference in mix. Yes. Okay. There's a criteria to the mix. There's a criteria, because I always thought, like, sparkling wine and champagne, but it doesn't come from Champagne, France, therefore you can't call it champagne. You know, uh, same thing, cognac, France, or whatever the case is. Tequila, Mexico. Yeah. You know? yeah. But but that's not the case. Well, that's mostly the case, but there's also, there is a minimum criteria. Yeah, to be a bourbon or a rye or stuff like or that. Or a tequila or, or whatever or, the case or is. Or you just call it whiskey. Yeah. You know, and I mean, it's so, technically so, all whiskey, but, you know. So quick question. You're out of the country, you're traveling, and you go to a bar. What do you order? Because nothing is going to be as good as your... Yeah, so I've become, you know, especially like old fashions, like right off the bat, uh, I'll get to the other, but, but old fashions, like I'll even ask be- how you make it before I even order one. Yeah. You know, and, and I believe it or not, a lot of times if they don't have big ice cubes, I won't even order it because I, I already know it's not something they specialize in. And, it, you know, it's, right. you get picky about it. And when you make your own, you know, like I'm sure a chef, you know, when he goes and eats somewhere, you know, he'll ask some questions or I'm going to mind trying different stuff. Yeah. Can I look in your <laughs> kitchen real quick? You know. But, like, I, I like to try stuff I haven't seen or tried before. Like, I just got back from uh, Tennessee, Nashville, and I actually looked for a lot of stuff that I can't get here because there's, you know, local people, and I'd ask the bartenders, you know, what's something, you know, and I'd look, oh, I haven't seen that. Can I try that? Yeah. And uh, so I like trying different stuff. I don't always go for what I do. I like stuff that's cast in different barrels. So it means it's aged like your regular bourbon, and they might cast it for six months in a rum cast barrel. Mm. Cherry barrel, mm-hmm. wine barrel, anything like that. I love the flavors. Like Whistle Pig 12 is one of my favorite. It's Which one? Whistle Pig 12. Whistle 12 Pig 12. 12. <clears throat> it's cast in three different barrels. So I love stuff that's cast like that in different barrels, you know, so. Yeah, it changes it all up. Yeah, I like to try different stuff and, and things Have like that. Have you tried, that. Um, fuck, man, do I remember? Buglati? I think it's Buglati. I haven't heard of that one. Yeah, they, they, they were they were an old brand. It's it's oily. Oh, I can't. I got I got to find it's it and post it. It's a bourbon or a whiskey. It's it's a whiskey. It's yeah. a whiskey. But this company, this company, you know, I think. No, I think it's a scotch. I'm sorry, it's a scotch. Scotch. It's a scotch. <clears throat> Buglati. 
and and they had they had a place a facility but it wasn't being used for like something many years and they just had alcohol just sitting there and then this company i believe if i remember correctly it's called Buklati. Gotcha. Uh, book, yeah, book Lottie. And they have one that if you just touch the liquid, it's oily. Like, it's super. Wow. But it's delicious. And, and it, it's it's fair price. It's like $600 a bottle. I mean, I know people are like, oh, my God, that's crazy. But compared to, like, a Louis thirteen or, you know, compared to most expensive bottles, something that age and something like that is is amazing. Yeah. And, and the thing about it, people don't realize how much prohibition affected the whole world. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because, you know, your stuff's aged a certain amount of time. So when, like, Prohibition stopped, we weren't having those bourbon barrels over here. So Scotland wasn't getting the barrels from us, you know, for the ex-bourbons and stuff. So that's why you don't see stuff aged 200 years. You you know what I mean? You you know, you're seeing stuff that's aged 92 years right now, and they want, like, $100,000 for it. Yeah. You know, it's crazy. I just seen an ad, and I forgot what it was. I think it was a scotch, and it was, like, a... It was a cognac. I'm sorry. It was a hundred thousand dollars for the bottle. Yeah, I was in Cuba a few <coughs> years ago. They had a uh, they had a four hundred and ninety year old rum that they had found. You know, because you know Cuba celebrated Havana celebrated five hundred years, and they they found that I believe it was like a pirate ship thing, whatever. But the thing was like one shot was like fifteen hundred dollars or something. I was like, fuck, man, for one ounce, like, oh, and I get it. I get it, but yeah. like, it was called Santiago 500, Santiago 500, something like that. See, that was the thing. Uh, um, rums were big back then because everybody on a ship, you know, water was bad. They would drink rum, everything like that. And that's what basically started America making bourbon was was part of the, the revolution that English, uh, they were blockading us. Yeah. So we couldn't get the molasses and stuff that we used to make the rum. So the Americans, George Washington, our forefathers looking around, we have all these grains. We rye all this stuff and that's where that's where it all started were the native uh were the native americans the indians were uh, were they did they have alcohol i know they were big on marijuana and medicine and all that stuff but did they have any like um any alcohol substance? i'm not saying that they didn't uh because I, I think I'm, buffalo trace is like the oldest american that's a distillery yeah there's yeah. like three major distilleries that but you know, they've been around like before america or something like that right that's what they promote i don't know for sure I'm, i've been around before america I mean, you know, all our forefathers came over and I mean, I'm sh- they were bootlegging over there. But like I said, right. where bourbon came from was they started using all the grains that were here because they were blockade because everybody drank rum back then. Yeah. So that's where that's where it started changing. That's where your bourbon started coming from and stuff like that. And they started just evolving from there. <clears throat> so it was it was, you know, pretty good history on seeing stuff like that. But the, the Indians, I, I'm sure they had something that they drank, but I'm not I've never really heard of anything, to be honest with you. I know they had teas. You know, obviously, any anything they can like, yeah, they had stuff, but well, they had uh, and all. I'm sure they put it into liquid form. They didn't just smoke it; they probably drank it at times too. Yeah, maybe like the whole ayahuasca stuff too, but that was more South America. But I'm sure they had their own version here. Yeah, yeah, and, and like a lot of the meads and stuff like that didn't follow everybody over across. You know, from the from the other from the uh, European nations, you didn't have a lot of that stuff. You know, when yeah. you go back and look at the generations on how how uh, alcohols were made and the, and the areas what they drank and stuff like that made with honey and just everything else you, you normally seen what was abundance and like i just get to get back to that again this is we had all this this grain yeah and, uh they didn't you know not until we got blockade did they started making it with that it was all had to be rum so what, what I'm, I'm just thinking about because you, you mentioned the rum thing and <clears throat> And, and I remember rum, even, I mean, you're talking years ago, but I'm talking about just in the last 20 years, rum used to be a big deal. You know, strawberry daiquiris, mojitos, a rum and coke, Cuba Libres. Uh, it was a big deal. Now it doesn't seem, I don't hear anybody talk about rum. What what would be, in, in, in your lifetime, your opinion, how would you describe alcohol? Like when you grew up, what was the thing? And then when you were in your 20s, what was the thing? Like, well, how would you well, phase geez, that out? I Just mean, to your personal opinion. I mean, you could go back. I mean, even it was, you know, at first, obviously, it was beer. You know, Mickey's Big Mouse or Hornets or, you know, when, when we I were young, Hornets. it was it was Milwaukee's best because it was four bucks a 12-pack. Or you know? Boonies. Remember Boonies? <clears throat> yeah, yeah, Boonies. <laughs> even Zima's. Remember Zima's? Damn it, though, I do remember them. I mean, that That's type bad of... bad memories. Yeah, just how stuff, you know, went around. Or even Boone's Farm. Zima. You know, Boone's Farm. It's just like... <laughs> oh God! Yeah, let's go through the phases, and then yeah, and then and then you finally get to you know <clears throat> you're right. It was a lot of uh, it was a lot of stuff like daiquiri stuff like that. It was almost like you know like when you were 
going to Mexico or Hawaii or some all your fruity drinks like that and like pina said, coladas, pina coladas, your rums and stuff. And then um, I think what started coming in after that, and I don't know about in between, but it was you know your microbrewery started coming in. <coughs> but that, that that's more recent, no? Yeah, I mean, well, even they started coming in, but they became more popular. Correct. And they were just blowing up. Everything was microbreweries. And then stuff started switching over now. I don't know if you noticed, too, people started distilling their own stuff and, and making their own spirits. That's the next boom It's coming right now. So you're going you're gonna to go to bars that are actually making their own vodka, tequila, and rum, and you can taste it there and everything. Uh, I've been seeing a lot more starting to pop up. And the spirits is just is just blowing up like that. It's That's, that's the next wave. You're just starting to see it now. But that's going to be like the microbreweries next. It's because it's also happening up in the wineries too right now because <clears throat> a lot of the wineries are becoming distilleries too because a part of their product is already one step closer to fermenting and they have to throw that stuff away with the grapes. Like I went up to Paso Robles. Uh, I've been up there a couple times and they actually make uh, vodka. They make their vodka out of grapes and, cool. they, and they distill it. How's that? Oh, it was it was amazing. They make gin. Because well, and, and just 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 people that are listening, uh, vodka is usually what potato based, right? Well, it can be potato, corn, uh, a lot of a lot of different bases. You know what I mean? But normally, because you distill it so many times, it takes the flavor out. That's why vodka just adheres to whatever you normally drink. Yeah, there's not very many people drink it on the rock. Some do, and you know it's specific. There's not really a taste to it. They might put a squeeze of a lime in it, and they like it. Right. But they make a gin out of the grapes because, you know, once they smash all the grapes up, that's one process already ready to ferment. <clears throat> they even took a vodka and aged it in a bourbon barrel. And I'm telling you, it tastes like a bourbon. Wow. It was unreal. So they're starting to use this stuff instead of throwing it away. It's already there. Yeah, of course. They're losing money instead. They're made, turning it into money. Yeah. So you're starting to see that at your wineries. People that are big wine tasting now, that they go and, and they actually have distilleries in the wineries now. And you could actually taste wine or you can taste spirits. Wow. That's starting to blow up. So now that's what's too. blowing up. Uh, moon, moonshine. Like, what would be the definition of moonshine? Is it because it, it, I know Americans call it moonshine, but the, the reason I ask is because I have a lot of Russian friends and Armenian friends and they make their own vodka and it's a hundred proof and, it, and it's delicious. It's fucking delicious. It's like yeah. apricot vodka and it's very flavorful. It's delicious. It's strong. You take two, three shots, you're warm, you're buzzed, you're happy. But is that a moonshine or like is, is moonshine a certain alcohol or it's just, you, you know, people that make their own? Well, I mean, realistically, the, the moonshine I make is is technically whiskey. Yeah. You know, you could just, I guess you yeah, just Yeah, so call that's it, my question. You so you're, ma it, you're making whiskey, but what's, what's. It's it's the same though. I mean, yeah. like a lot of the times if you watch, you know, moonshiners, they'll make probably a lot of it's almost all corn based. Right. And I, ma I make a corn base. That's what I make my apple pie out of. Um, I mean, they call it moonshine, but it's technically, it's whiskey. Yeah. And I mean, you could call the same thing even if Buffalo Trace made a big old batch. It's going to come out looking like that. You could call it, you know, technically, moonshine. I guess that. I think they just call it moonshine because they were out in the woods and sometimes it'd be night. And, you know, I, I you know, I, I don't know the whole story to that. But yeah. I mean, it's it's whiskey. <laughs> that sounds like the the, what is it, the blue moon? Yeah. Blue moon. Yeah. And it was like, oh, they made this beer yeah. and it was like so good. And they looked up and they're like, oh, this is as rare as yeah. a blue moon. I'm sure if somebody's going, there's a, he doesn't know what he's talking about. There's a story to this. Yeah. And there probably is. Oh, there's a story to everything, but yeah. we're not going to know it all. But it's, uh, I mean, it's technically, it's, it's, it's a whiskey, you yeah. know? And I could distill that enough times and it would probably almost be like a vodka. You know what I mean? It's like if you look at where people are, their regions, that's what they use. You know, like a lot of the times in, in Russia, it was potatoes or Poland potatoes or their vodka. But you can make it with anything. You know, vodka is pretty simple. There's not a whole lot to it. Now, like your gins are a little different, you know, has the botanicals and stuff like that that give it the flavor and, and stuff. You can go. What kind of berries does it have? It has some. Oh, geez. It, you, I mean, there's so many different ways, but there is a main berry, and I don't remember what yeah. it is. I haven't got into that. Jim berry, um, something like that. Juju berry, something like that. Yeah. And I do have a. Uh, uh, I went and bought it in my still, so I could actually put flavors in it as it's going through. So I could, I could start doing gins and stuff. But I've been having such, you know, fun with the bourbons and stuff like that. I haven't got to that yet. So. Yeah. But yeah, it's uh, it's pretty fun. I enjoy it. And, and no, I, I was just asking because I, I have I have a little bottle right there that a buddy of mine brought from Colombia, and it's called Aguardiente. And black and white, it's kind of like Colombia's national moonshine. Gotcha. And it, it tastes like 
it tastes like black licorice. But you finish a bottle of that. The nickname for that is uh, Agua Loca, which is crazy water. Because uh, you finish that, you're just... <sighs> See, and, and what people don't understand, it doesn't come out in that right flavor. Close to the mic, sorry. It, but it doesn't come out in that flavor. Yeah. I, I mean... It's, they add that. Obviously. Yeah, they're, they're adding those flavors to it and stuff like that. So and It's um, such a bad flavor to add black licorice. Nobody likes black licorice. I, uh, I used to have a guy that was... A buddy I knew that was Danish. And he loved this black licorice that they would bring over. And I mean, it tasted like shit, but yeah. he loved it. It's an acquired taste, yeah. Th- you're brought up that way. You know what I mean? You, they were probably that way, and somehow they probably soaked that same licorice in that booze. And they're like, oh, man, I, I ate this as a kid. I love it. Yeah. Yeah, and we're like, it tastes like shit. But, you know, yeah. it's, it's kind of Yeah, the thing is. is, that one kind of starts, like, tasting not as good, but it's alcohol. So after two or three shots, you're like, I love black licorice. You know? That's like anything. You're, it's you're, the greatest thing. Yeah, you're, you're, your, first drink, your first drink comes through. Sorry, sorry. Uh, yeah, you're good. Your first drink comes through, and uh, you know sometimes it's a little rough. By your second one, you're like, "Oh man, this is good stuff," you know. Yeah. <laughs> so you and, just got to warm up a little bit. And then uh, regarding your motorcycle, you have a street line. Yeah, 2017. 2017, 114. Is that the M8? Um, or you have a 110. 110. Oh, you have the 110. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then uh, how'd you how'd you hear about the bike shed? So I knew uh, uh, Chris and his wife uh, used to own the me- uh, mechanic shop around the corner. Yeah. And he builds bikes. Okay. So he had a bike shop actually in the, the little bar, and they had a lot of barrel age stuff there. And because we worked downtown LA, we just ran across it, and we'd go there and have drinks. I mean, they had barrel aged everything, rum, all kinds of stuff. That's why before, I love it. Before this location. Yes. Before the new owners. But Yeah, before these new owners. And the pandemic hit, and that place closed down. So then it was just weird. Uh, I, I was at Denny's one day over there, uh, right by the, uh, uh, the, the the prison, basically, right there yeah. at the 101. And uh, I ran into them. And they're like, yeah, we're opening this, or, you know, we're, you know, helping these people open this new place and stuff. And I was like, cool, we've been looking for a new place, you know, and it sounds like a good theme. So, yeah, because Chris, he, he actually builds, you know, choppers for some high-end people and stuff like that. I so don't know if I met Chris. He did a lot of work around there. He did a lot of the machine shop work and stuff like that uh, there. Yeah. So his wife's the redheaded one. Um, she's there during the days most of the time, so I haven't been there. But yeah, so he's working there now. No, he still, I, he no, still no, has no. a shop. He did, he he has a shop. I think mean, she works there. Got it. So he was just uh, he was helping out as they were building. Yeah, because I think I found out shit, I bought my my membership in November there. Really? Yeah, yeah. I thought they were going to be open a lot sooner, but everybody then. Yeah, but everybody then, except for me, because I had no idea of their existence until their opening grand night and just a bunch of people were like, you got to check this place out. You got to check this place out. Yeah. And the next day I was like, I'm fucking, I want part of it. Yeah. I, I want part of it. I really love what they've created. Yep. Uh, one of my buddies, I just put a post up for my last podcast. He described it the best way. It's uh, it's an MC for people that don't want to be a part of an MC, you know, like, yeah. you know, without going the full extent of like, you know, it, so. it's kind of funny too. Cause the Mongols clubhouse is just down the street from there. Isn't just, I mean, down the street. Wow, I didn't know that. Yeah. Like, yeah. right. And and then, that, so, they're an MC, MC then. Oh, the they're, bike one, they're a one person. Uh, no, no, bike shed. Bike oh. shed is an actual MC that's, because re- you have to register for to be an MC, uh, from my understanding. I don't know, I don't know if you're familiar with that, but anytime you put MC on, on a vest or anywhere, you have to register it as an MC. Gotcha. So, I, I now, and you, there's usually a membership fee, and. They have a membership and they're posting MC. So I think it's like a MC MC wow. without being an MC, hmm. you know? Yeah. But I, I like the fact that they're keeping it limited. You know, I think, what is it? A thousand? Yeah. A thousand. And they're going to have a hundred life uh, time members, which that's pretty cool too. Yep. Um, especially for the new people. Cause I guess the pricing, you know, jumped a little bit. So it almost makes more sense that part, but. Gotcha. You know. And I think that's some whiskey cabinets there. They haven't figured out the pricing on that yet. So I think they, they I, it's funny because they sent it on the post uh, recently saying they were still trying to calculate that. But I did receive something that they came down to a conclusion. You know? Yeah. Um, I, won't, I mean, I want to throw numbers out there. I've heard a little bit about it, but I uh, don't know for sure. Yeah. And I was thinking about doing, I was thinking, oh, man, I'll get a locker and I'll put like a really nice expensive bottle. But then, uh, but then a good buddy of mine told me, that's a terrible idea. And I go, why? He goes, because if you get buzzed or drunk and one of your buddies is like, let's open the locker. I'll be like, yeah, let's open the locker. And I go, this is a pretty bad idea. <laughs> yeah, because, I mean, realistically, the, the reason you would get a locker is if they don't have a booze that you, you like to drink on that or a special occasion yeah, or so something. Yeah, so you would put your moonshine in there. and 
Yeah, and they're going to build a deck off the back there so you can smoke cigars you know, later on, so you can probably put some cigars in there, you know, stuff like that. But yeah, it's, I mean, it's it's good theme. It's a good setup. So, I mean, they, they seem to be getting pretty busy. Yeah, I, I, I smoke every now and then cigarettes, and uh, I said, you know what? My birthday's coming up next month. I go, once once my birthday comes, I think I'm just going to move with just the cigars. You know, just, you know, my nationality is Cuban, so it makes sense. <laughs> I should just be doing cigars. That's it. it so I probably got into cigars probably about two, two and a half years ago. Never really smoked. I never smoked cigarettes or anything. Yeah. And it was funny because, you know, I'll drink my whiskey. You know, it's the Irishman in me and I'll drink it and I'll be fine. I smoked half that cigar and had one whiskey and I stood up and I was like, Ooh, what was that? I feel dizzy, yeah. You know, so it, when you, it does give you a little, little effect too with the cigars too, but it ain't nothing like a nice cigar with a whiskey. You ever dip it? I don't. Yeah. I, I've watched people dip them. Yeah, it I makes am. the smoke smoother. Smoke smoother. Yeah, I'll the, try the that smoke that time. comes through it, it's so much smoother. It makes it very nice. Yeah, I'll try that. But I do enjoy a good cigar with a good whiskey and just chill and relax and stuff like that. So, yeah, I'm not the connoisseur on cigars as I am with my bourbons. Of course, you know. So, but yeah, you're not making your own cigars. Not yet. Yeah, not 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 yet. Like saying, "Oh, she'll be. She, what are you What are you trying to grow back there?" I was like, oh, "Somebody mm. asked me that, you know." <laughs> That's how it I starts. I was doing a podcast, and then they put this idea, and what? Yeah, yeah. She gets, she'll tell me. She'll see when I'm cooking out there, because as I'm cooking, you know, I'm tasting it. And then I'm tasting all my barrels that I have aging and stuff. She says, you're all sassy when you come in, you know? And it's just funny. It's like a, you know, a chef when he's eating, he's cooking, and he's eating, and I'm drinking. So yeah. it's, it's a good time. And then how, uh, another question. How'd you get into motorcycles? What was your first experience? That's something that I usually like asking everybody. Oh, well, I mean... I rode dirt bikes as a kid forever, you know, even the three wheel quads. I mean, Glamis, El Mirage, just, I rode all, all as a kid, even the old, old school. Uh, so dad got you into it, got yeah, you a dirt bike. A dirt biking. And then when I got older, I lived in Rancho Cucamonga and I worked in downtown LA and traffic sucked. Yeah. So still does. I went through, uh, <laughs> still does. I, I went through three bikes just going back and forth to work, you know, everything from a Seca 600 to a Bandit 1200 to an R R six, you know, um, and then I finally went to a 2014 Harley, and then the 17. So I've kind of graduated. <clears throat> nice. I live closer now, so I don't have to ride to work. But yeah, geez, for 20 years I rode almost every single day to work. Yeah. Yep. And then your moonshine, can people buy it? Ah, uh, you know, you really don't sell yeah. moonshine. You know that that type of stuff. Uh, right so on. <laughs> yeah, it, it's a. Uh, um, you know, it's all good. You know, I, I enjoy just, you know. But sampling, but if somebody wanted like a sampling or something, they could oh, just yeah. reach out to you. I love doing tastings, you know, yeah, and tastings. I, I, I sit there and taste with them and I, I like to talk about it like I am right now. This is this how the sage is. We got to do this made. again with some samples and talk and describe it. And, you know, I'll bring yeah. somebody and it, it'd be a good experience. Oh, no, I, I'll, I'll do that again. Yeah, yeah, I brought some with me. I didn't know what it was going to be like. So, but yeah. next time, definitely, you know, maybe I'll bring my brother too and he can talk about the guns and. All that type of stuff. But yeah, we can do yeah, some Yeah, we'll sampling. talk about guns. And then in the middle, in between, you're like, try this one. and this, We'll that, try that. this one. We'll talk about it. And but at the end of the podcast, I'll bring out all my guns. And your brother will bring out all these guns. And there'll be booze and guns. And yeah, just America. America. <laughs> America. Yeah, yeah. But no, we can we can definitely do that. It's, it'd be awesome. So, I mean, I, I, mean I, I, I don't have a problem doing samplings and stuff like that. I mean, you know, I'm not licensed or anything like that. So it's not really like I'm selling it. No, no, privately. Oh, yeah. Publicly, no, no. but privately. Yeah. You know. Like for people to understand and, and describe and what to look for. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Or no. I, I guess I, I could just say I'm a bootlegger. You know, I could be like moonshiners. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Or I, I can I could change the tone of your voice and then like kind of black out your face and. You'll... It's funny. I, I people ask me that all the time. You sell it, and they're like, "Do you have a card?" I'm like, "No, I'm a bootlegger. I mean, why would I have a card for that? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's not legal." But so many people are doing crazy stuff like that. I I, I was looking at Facebook, and people were just like. Oh, got a pound of weed and, you know, it's this flavor. Call me up. And I'm like, what? <laughs> you know, what are you doing? Uh, people selling fake Rolexes and fake this online. And they're doing live videos. Hi, I'm Sally. You know, reach me. Uh, this is item three, two, one. I'm like, whoa, this is the balls. And I'm sure they get away. Obviously, they get away with it. Oh, well, you know. If, like, what, what, what's going to happen? I mean, I overthink it and say I would never do that. But then, like, really, what's going to happen? Well, What's going to make the police chase a guy that's selling a pound? I mean, they, they want the big quantities or anything like that. Same with me. I mean, if, I, if I'm selling, you know, thousands of gallons of booze, they want to tax it. Right. So, yeah, they're going to come after me. If I'm selling a couple jars to a couple buddies, you know, to pay for my supplies, 
I, I really don't think they're going to come after me. You, yeah. you know what I mean? So it, it's kind of, you know, on that aspect of it, you know, it's like making your own wine, you know, oh, I sold this guy a bottle for 20 bucks and, you know, I, I don't think the IRS or the uh, ATF is going to be knocking on my door. At all. Yeah, that, that's that's not a big concern. Yeah. So I guess this is why people do it. Yeah, I mean, you can, there's nothing saying that you, I mean, it's not illegal to buy the still. You know, you can go online. You know, I do, uh, I think it's Mile High out of Colorado is where I bought mine from. I mean, pff, they send you the whole kit. There's nothing saying that you can't buy it in California. You know, sometimes there's some stuff. You can buy it everywhere else but California. So Not even that? No. Nothing. As far as I know, there's no law against that part. It, it, it's about the quantities, I think. You know, if it's just your own stuff you're making. I mean, because technically you can make hand, you can make fuel and hand, hand sanitizer with the same thing, too. Yeah. You can. So it's, it's a little bit of a gray line, I guess. Uh, and then how would you explain, I like moonshines. I, li- I like these vodkas. I, I like, your, your, like your 100 proof. I, I, I like it. You know, yeah. I, I, some people can't handle it i really like it i mean what, what's the ju- you know justification for that am i an alcoholic or no like, i mean it just taste better it feels good well in my opinion and, and it's smoother than the, the, the other issue that i have is that you drink 151 bacardi 151 like that's fucking fire like i don't know why that tastes so fire but you drink your stuff or or the homemade stuff that i've tried is, is delicious so your your 100 proof unless it so like with mine, like I say, it comes well, 100%, out. hundred percent, all hundred alcohol. 100, it's a hundred proof. So it's 50. percent, 50 percent. Yeah. Yeah. Like, okay. Your Jack Daniels is 80 proof. Most of your vodkas are 80 proof. Right. So most of my stuff is no less than, than a hundred proof. So, um, basically with the way I do it. So like Jack Daniels might come out at 150 and they might age it at 150, but they water it down. So it stays consistently at 80 proof all the way through. So maybe that's a difference where you can taste the flavors and the tastes and stuff like that. Where mine, there's no uh, uh, no water, wa- it's not watered down. So even my 100 proof comes out of the still at 100 proof, you know, because it comes out in stages. Like I was saying, it drops 10%. <clears throat> so mm-hmm. there's no water in mine. I mean, it's not like I'm watering it down to make it, you know. But that makes sense. It's 100 proof, which means it's 50% alcohol, which is still drinkable. Or 151 is 151 proof, which is 78% alcohol. Well, did you try my 130 proof rye? I, I, had I loved night? it. Yeah, yeah, it was the I, first thing you poured. I, I loved it. And that's smooth for 135 proof. I, I normally don't tell people the proof because then they, they make a face, but then they taste it and you see them yeah. go, wow, that, I would never know that's 135 proof because it's very smooth and good. And that's not aged. I mean, that's just straight white lightning. Yeah. You know? And, and, and do you know the reason why they do proof versus alcohol? Because proof just basically is a description of how much alcohol, but what, what, what's the main, why are we using proof? I don't know, to be honest with you. I've never, never really looked that up because both of them are on the bottle. Yeah. You know, most of these bottles. Yeah, you're right. It, it'll, it'll have both. Does it have proof? Yeah. Prove it to me. <laughs> Do the tequila. That's the rocks tequila. Let me see here. Every celebrity's got a tequila. No, I'm wrong on this one. It, it goes 40% alcohol. Yeah. yeah, I've always seen alcohol, but I don't think I've seen the proof. Yeah, you could be right, to be honest with you on that. I but guess a I lot just of people, know I double it, you know? yeah, I, I, I know, I know, or I believe they have the choice of putting proof or alcohol. They could put whatever they want. Now that's that's a agua loco. <laughs> that's that other one. Yeah, you're probably right on that. To be honest with you, I think some people do put proof or they put alcohol, but I've never seen both of them at the same time. I think you could be right on that. Yeah. No. Now, now I'm gonna look. Now I want to find no. out. I'm yeah, look. we need to find out what the difference is between proof and alcohol. Yeah, I mean it's just double. We know that. Yeah, so. yeah, or divided in two. Yeah. Well, let's do this again. Let's do the samples. Let's get your brother in here. Your brother's into guns, right? Yep. yep. So he's a collector. He does he train or? Yeah, he, he's a, a assistant master director at the three gun competition every month up there. Okay, well, so, maybe, maybe we could set up a day where we go shoot guns, and then the next day we do a podcast. And yeah, he'd, he'd that'd love be to. Awesome. He can set, he, they set up all the, the targets, you know, where you go through the obstacles and stuff like I, that. Yeah, I'd love that. that that's, that's what the three gun is. So yeah. it's pistol, shotgun, and an AR. Yeah. Through, you, go, you shoot different stages and get to shoot all kinds of different stuff. Yeah, I, I've done it, but I've done individual. Like I did a, a shotgun course at ITTS over here by Angeles Crest, um, and then the, then another weekend I did a shotgun class. Then another weekend I did the AR. You'd love three gun then. Yeah, it's, it's so a you're lot of fun. all of them. 
Yeah, not, like one stage might be pistols and shotgun. One might be AR and shotgun. That's badass. One might be all pistol. There's normally like five five uh, different stages, and they're all different. Yeah. So. And I just bought a new shotgun, semi-auto. Fucking amazing. Yeah, I'll show you. I'll bring my M2 Benelli that he he custom did for me. All the stippling. The Benelli's 12 round, are badass too. Twelve round tube comes out the front. All that yeah. good stuff. He does all. He did it all for me. So. You mean ten round, right? In California. Yeah. Oh, you're Arizona. Nice. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Something like that. Yeah, yeah. So it's uh, it's all good. But yeah, we'll do that for sure. Cool. Let's plan it. All right. All right, brother. Thank all right, man. You. Thanks. And we're done. Oh, nice and simple. Catch up.